I, I got to do a, uh, I got to do an Instagram of you guys. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much argument I had to do to get my staff to let me do Instagram by myself. So say hello to the whole world, everybody. Hey. All right. You'll see that tonight. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's just so much fun to be here and to be with so many friends and see people that I've known for so many years in different contexts. I was here in Farmington last week. Did you know that? Electronically. Mary and I were at, did a press conference with uh, Burgess Record and Sandy and uh, 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 Mr. Kerr, who's here, I think, uh, on the wonderful work that they've done at the hospital in terms of community outreach and doing something about cardiovascular disease, which is national and worldwide news. The occasion was the publication of an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association about the Franklin County experience over 40 years, which is really uh, quite amazing. But it happened that Mary and I were in Washington together, and we did a thing uh, from the Capitol through uh, uh, with a, a camera and a, and a hookup, and it was really uh, it was really wonderful. Dr. Dan Onion, who was one of the people, had been Mary's doctor, and I'd known uh, Burgess and Sandy for many years, and Fen Fowler, uh, and I go back to the Joshua Chamberlain administration together. <laughs> uh, so it was uh, it was really great to be here. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, foreign policy and. Uh, but first, I, I want to get, you know, we've, we've got Putin and, and the Ukraine and Syria and Iraq, but, but really we need to talk about deflated footballs. <laughs> uh, but I think deflate gate is kind of 70s. I have a new suggestion. How about this? Balgazi. <laughs> Don't you think? Balgazi. You know, that's, and I'm not, that's about all I'm going to say about it, except, uh, I don't know about you, but I ain't buying that Gronk spiking the ball made it deflate. I, that, that doesn't work uh, for me. Okay. I went to Washington as a former governor with virtually no international experience. Although I must tell you, as governor, I considered... Washington foreign relations. <laughs> I mean, that was my, you know, uh, uh, foreign relation. But, you know, as a governor, you don't deal with those kinds of international issues. I did do regular trade missions. In fact, Marge Matt is here somewhere. Where are you, Marge? Marge was with me on my very first trade mission to Japan in 1995. And something funny happened on that trip which I told my colleagues, I had occasion to tell my colleagues in the Senate last week, and they all think it's the funniest story they've ever heard, and they were all telling each other last night on the floor this, this story. I was invited to speak at a small town in, in central Japan, and when I got there, there was a sign over the, a banner, you know, over the stage in, in kanji, in, in Japanese. And, um, you know, I didn't think much of it. I didn't know what it said. And I went ahead and made my speech and came home two or three weeks later and happened, there were pictures of the, of the trip. And one of them was of this speech. And I was showing the pictures to the friend of mine who spoke Japanese. And he looked at the picture and burst out laughing. And I said, what are you, what's so funny? He said, well, do you know what that sign says? I said, no. He said, well, the Japanese had a perfectly good word in their language for king. But they had a problem with Angus. So the sign said, welcome, large, black cow, king. <laughs> Isn't that, that's an absolutely true story. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's amazing I have any international anything after that. Uh, so... Anyway, so I go to Washington, and what you do in Washington, of course, you go with your priorities for your state. You know, uh, from Maine, you, you worry about manufacturing and, and software and shipbuilding and, you know, all of the various, uh, uh, the timber industry, of course. But then you get assigned to committees. And that largely defines where your focus is going to be. And it's somewhat uh, the luck of the draw 
although in my case I requested to be on the Armed Services Committee because Maine has had a senator on the Armed Services Committee since Margaret Chase Smith in 19, I think, uh, 50 or 48, with one six-year period in the 70s. But ever since then, Margaret Chase Smith, Bill Cohen, uh, Susan Collins, and Susan uh, texted me. Susan, by the way, says, I text her more than anyone except her niece. Um, <laughs> But Susan texted me and, and when as I was coming down. She said, I'm leaving the Armed Services Committee to go to the Appropriations Committee, so you should you know, do this. So I applied, asked Harry Reid to join the Armed Services Committee, and I said, Whatever, wherever else you want to put me is fine. I, but as long as you, if you give me the Armed Services Committee, I'm okay, you know, just whatever. So I put, got on the Armed Services Committee, and then uh, he, I was also on rules, budget, and to prove Harry has a sense of humor, intelligence, <laughs> uh, which has turned out to be a sort of amazing experience because it has thrust me into the middle of Syria, Iraq, Snowden, CIA, you know, all of the Israel, Palestine, Iran negotiations, all of these issues. I've lived for the last two uh, plus years. Uh, so it, it has been a, a, a quite an education. And then I've done some traveling. Now, you hear about congressional traveling. Um, I, I, I'm not crazy about congressional traveling, but there, there are two reasons to do it. One is learn, you learn something. And the second is you, it's relationship building. You, you build relationships with your colleagues that, are, that can be very important. So I've taken four trips since I've been uh, in office. The first was in the summer of 2013 to Jordan and Turkey with Carl Levin, who was the chair of the uh, Armed Services Committee, just the two of us. Uh, and then uh, last winter, uh, Tim Kaine and I, Tim Kaine is a senator from Virginia who's on armed services, he's on foreign relations, and I'm on intelligence. So between the two of us, we cover the three principal committees that deal with foreign affairs. He's an absolutely wonderful guy. So Tim and I went to Israel and Lebanon. Uh, and then in, in October, uh, Tim and I went on another trip to uh, India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. If you're getting a drift here, it's that I don't go to Paris and London. Uh, only, I only go to the real garden spots. Um, and then just, uh, well, this, you heard on the news this morning, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia died and the crown prince uh, Salman is the king. At exactly this time, one week ago, I was with crown prince Salman in Saudi Arabia. Last Thursday night, because it was Martin Luther King weekend, we had four days, uh, John McCain and I and Lindsey Graham and Tim uh, Cain and Joe Donnelly and John Barrasso, bipartisan group, uh, we left Andrews Air Force Base at um, 7 at night, Thursday night, got to Saudi Arabia because it's a 13-hour trip, and then because of the time change, it was like 4 in the afternoon on Friday, Spent that evening in Saudi Arabia, all day Saturday in Saudi Arabia, meeting with all kinds of various people, including the, the crown prince. Uh, then in the afternoon, uh, flew to Qatar. Now, I'm going to share something with you that, that I've learned. I'm going to make you guys the most knowledgeable, cool foreign policy people in Maine. <laughs> the, the country Q-A-T-A-R, all my life I've been reading it saying Qatar or something like that. Uh-uh. It's gutter, like G-U-T-T-E-R. The people who live there are called the gutteries. So if you say to somebody, yes, uh, what are we going to do with our policy with gutter, they'll, they'll know that you're cool. You're in. You know. <laughs> Here's the other one that I just learned last weekend. We all know about ISIL and, da and, and uh, ISIS. Uh-uh. In the Middle East, they're called Dash. I don't know what the words stand for, but it's called the, because the, the first meeting I was at, the, the uh, Saudis were talking about Dash, and I didn't know what they were talking about. So now you can talk about Dash, and, and you know that it, you know, that this is the real word for ISIL or ISIS. So, um, so anyway, we were in Saudi Arabia, then went to Qatar, which is a very interesting country. It's where Doha is. 
uh, which is one of the most modern cities in the world. And it's a country that has been very cooperative and helpful to us in the air war in Syria against ISIS. The base, I'm not giving away any secrets, the air base where the air war is being conducted from, uh, and we went to it, it's, it looks like a giant video game. And it's very international. The guy who was in charge of the room the day we were there was a Canadian. It's truly a coalition, but that's where they direct the, the flights uh, into uh, uh, Syria and, and Iraq. So Qatar is cooperating in that sense, but the, in, in, that, uh, in that effort. But there have been some questions about which side they've been supporting, and they're private citizens. It's a lot of oil wealth. Uh, but I think they're trending more in our direction. And then we went to Israel. Uh, and met with uh, uh, a whole bunch of Israeli officials, including uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his opponents. He's engaged in a, in a very tough election campaign for the middle of March. Um, and we met with him and then met. It's very interesting. He's, he's got two opponents who are running as a team, a man and a woman, and the, the agreement is if we win the election, one of us will be prime minister for two years and the other will be prime minister for two years. And it's, it, it, I was surprised. I assumed Netanyahu you know, was a shoe-in, but apparently not. It's very close. Their politics are very complicated in Israel. It's a, a, co it's a parliamentary system and they're always coalitions. So uh, we were in Israel and so Monday night, uh, dinner in Israel, dinner in Jerusalem, and we were back in Washington Tuesday morning at 7.30 and the State of the Union uh, that night. Uh, so, but here's the thing. When Tim and I walked into the uh, office of the National Security Advisor in Pakistan, who was an older gentleman, not many people are older than me, uh, but he said, gentlemen, I know why you're here. And we said, oh, why is that? He said, because one day of seeing is better than one month of reading. That was an important insight. And that's exactly what I've learned. You can read reports and have briefings and have hearings and everything else, but seeing, being there, talking to people, not only the big shots, but the, you know, the guards and the lo lower level US people. By the way, the people we have working for us overseas are fantastic. It drives me crazy when people talk about the bureaucrats, you know, and they down them. We've got young, idealistic, smart, dedicated people who are working under difficult conditions. It's dangerous. And they're, they're really, and they, you know, they have to put up with furlough days and no raises for five years and all that kind of thing. They're really wonderful people. When I got back from the trip last fall, Mary said, well, what was the big thing you learned? I said, what great people we have. So I just wanted to mention that. OK, what I've got are 10 things I've learned for, about foreign policy uh, in, in the last uh, two years. Number one, it's really complicated. <laughs> the best analogy I heard, I heard on this, just on this trip. It was one of the Saudi diplomats who said, it's funny, it's so funny to hear foreigners using American you know, metaphors like, like the, the Qatari said, well, what we need to deal with Daesh or ISIS is we need America to be the quarterback. <laughs> you don't expect an Arab diplomat to be, you know, <laughs> the quarterback. Uh, but this guy said, you know, when you play pool, you have one cue ball and 10 balls. And he said, that was the world 25, 50 years ago. Today, it's 10 cue balls and 100 balls on the table. And everything is moving. In fact, I, I had to actually write this down. As you can tell, I don't like to read speeches. But i got to read you this. Here's how complicated it is. In Syria, we're on the same side as ISIS, opposed to Assad, Russia, and Iran. Except that we work with Russia to help Assad get rid of his chemical weapons. But then you go to Iraq. And we're on the same side as Iran against ISIS, who's on our side in, in, in Syria. You, uh, you getting this? And then we're, against the, we're, we're on the same side as Iran in Iraq, but we're against Iran in terms of their nuclear program. And in Yemen, you've got al-Qaeda and a new group called the Houthis, who just took over. 
And apparently the senior leadership has told us that we're okay, you don't have to abandon your embassy, but the younger guys are shooting at our embassy or shooting at our people. So it's just, it's just so complicated to try to, you know, it's not like you can say, well, the British are our allies. It all, it's, it's all depends upon the situation and the country. So that's number one, is that it's just, uh, it's, it's just really unbelievably complicated. Um, the other piece is of this complication that we have to understand, and I'll touch on this in a, little, in a couple of minutes, but there's so much history involved that Americans aren't very good at. Uh, I met one of you somewhere, I hope she came, as a history teacher. Yes, we were chatting, and I told her, somebody asked me, what, it is you, what is it you do in Washington? I said, it's applied history with a minor in communications. <laughs> you know, that's what I do. But there's so much history. For example, the, the Israeli-Palestinian question really goes back 100 years to the very beginning, 100 plus years, to the beginning of Israel and when the Zionists came and the Palestinians were there and all of that. So there's 100 years. But the dispute between the, uh, the, the uh, Iranians and the Saudis is a basically a Sunni-Shiite division, which goes back to what, 800, I think? It's about 1,200 years old. There's been a sort of slow motion civil war in the Middle East between Sunnis and Shiites. And then on top of that, there's a slow motion civil war between the Persians and the Arabs. A lot of Americans don't realize Iranians aren't Arabs. Iranians are a different, literally different ethnic stock called Persians. And remember the term Darius the Great? That was a couple of thousand years ago. So you've got a 2,000-year-old civil war between the Persians and the Arabs. You've got a 1,200-year-old civil war between the Sunnis and the, and the Shiites. You've got a 100-year-old dispute between the Palestinians and the, and the Israelis. And you've got us in the middle of it. And so one of the th most important things to me is that we as Americans have to understand this history to determine where we can make a difference and where we can't and where we're just going to complicate things. And, and, and you know, the, the sort of underlying currents are, are much deeper and more complicated than you know, Americans think, well, we're going to go in in a few years and fix all this. And, and it just isn't, it, it isn't going to happen. So I think one of the lessons is we have to be very clear about what are our interests. Why are we there? And if we can't answer that question very clearly, then probably we shouldn't be there. Because we are, engaged, we are trying to sort of put our toe into these very complex uh, relationships. Okay, number two, uh, foreign policy has really changed a great deal because of the changed nature of the players. Traditionally, when we all grew up, you talk about foreign policy, you talk about countries, nation states, Germany, Japan, England, you know, Canada, U.S. By the way, we're close to Canada. Do you know the definition of a Canadian? An unarmed North American with health insurance. <laughs> Canadian. Canadian. Okay. Um, okay, so historically it's all been nation states. Now, and really the wake up was, was uh, September 11th, you've got nation states, but then you've got these uh, sort of, they call them non-state actors like Al-Qaeda who are organizations, but they don't really have a home. You know, Al-Qaeda sort of developed in Afghanistan, but Osama bin Laden was a Saudi, and, you know, they're, they're a sort of loose uh, organization, but not a nation state. I think that was one of the mistakes, frankly, of attacking Iraq after September 11th. Because Iraq didn't do September 11th. It, to me, it was like attacking Brazil after Pearl Harbor. You know, I mean, just, it was a vigorous response, but it didn't have anything to do with what the problem was. So then, so okay, we've now got our policymakers have, have figured out about non-state actors, but now it's gone even further. You have lone wolves. You have people who read about Al-Qaeda on the internet, you know, the kid in, in uh, Cincinnati who decided he's going to blow up the Capitol and be a jihadist, you know, he's, 
I don't remember his name, but you know, he's a you know, an American who just, you know, read about sort of, they call it self-radicalized. So you go and it was, you know, it was pretty simple when you're dealing with Russia, but now you've got, you've got countries and, and they're still big players. And then you've got these non-state actors, these groups, and then you've got individuals, which are terribly dangerous and can be uh, in terms of, of their access to, to weapons. So uh, number three, um, the change in the price of oil is a huge deal, a uh, huge international deal. Somebody told me in the Middle East that the drop in the price of oil has had about double the impact on Iran that the sanctions have had. Uh, and of course, it's having a huge impact on, on Putin and, and Russia. One of you told me they're going to send me some, I think uh, uh, Jay Knox said you're going to send me some things on Putin. Uh, but uh, it's, been a, it's a huge geopolitical change, and one of the interesting things about it is it sort of happened by itself in the sense that it wasn't like, you know, the Congress passed a law and oil prices went down. It was, it was a market kind of thing that's had huge implications, and um, uh, the big news is that the Saudis have decided not to prop the price up. They could. If the Saudis reduced production, which is what they've done in the past, prices would go back up. Nobody knows exactly. We asked the Saudis why they were doing that, because they're losing a ton of money. But you can lose money when you have a three quarters of a trillion dollars in the bank. Uh, but they, what they, their answer is, uh, we want to maintain market share. I don't think it's really killing them that this is really hurting Iran. <laughs> uh, because the Saudis, by the way, are Sunni, and the Iranians are Persian and Shia. So there's that, and of course it's, it's, it's definitely hurting uh, 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 Russia and Putin, uh, which you might say, well, you know, that's good. My worry is people who are trapped are dangerous. I'm worried about Putin because the, the, the noose is, is, is getting tight, and uh, uh, leaders have traditionally um, looked to external sort of activities, if not wars, in order to bail themselves out of internal political problems. Here's a little known fact. The day before the Falklands War, does anybody remember the Falklands War, Margaret Thatcher? Margaret Thatcher's approval rating in Britain was 23%. The week after the Falklands War, it was 70%. You know, I just hope Putin doesn't know that. Uh, and, and so I think it's, it's, not, uh, it's not all necessarily good news. Um, number four, climate change is part of foreign policy. It, it will become a bigger one. It didn't get all that much press. Why? Because it was good news. Only bad news gets press. I mean, I hope, I, I don't know who I've insulted now, but I used to say, if I got up one morning and walked across the Kennebec River, the headline would be, King Unable to Swim. <laughs> Legislature critical, you know? Um, Obama signing this climate thing with China is a big deal. It's not a binding agreement. The limits aren't as much as they should be. But the very fact that China is even talking about limits in terms of climate is a big deal because we can't solve it unilaterally. We can provide leadership, which is why, what I think we have to do, and that's why we have to do things like limit our uh, fossil consumption. But ultimately, it's, a, uh, it's an international problem. It's going to be a huge issue of international policy over the next uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And by the way, uh, this is the, to this, the talk isn't about climate change, but when you have it tonight, uh, uh, Google NOAA, N-O-A-A, National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, uh, uh, NOAA Arctic Ice. And they've done a little uh, video that shows in speeded up time the, the ice in the Arctic Ocean from 1987 till today. And it shows the old ice, which is the ice that never melts, and how it's shrinking. It's quite stunning. 
Um, by the way, I don't know if you're like me, but I think it's pretty cool to have been in, around at the invention of a new verb, to Google. <laughs> I mean, imagine if you could tell your grandchildren, I was there when they invented run. <laughs> you know? That's us, man. So check that out. It, it, really, is, uh, it, it really is fascinating. Um, number five. Le See, we're halfway through. It's good. Number five, leadership is really critical. One of the stories we heard in the Middle East just this past weekend was that in, I think it was 99 or 2000, Arafat, the leader of the Palestinians, there was a deal on the table that gave him and the Palestinians about 95% of what they wanted. And they'd have a country today, and he said no. And it was a, you know, if, if a different leader had said yes, we'd have two, two states, probably they would have worked out a lot of their security arrangements, and instead, the, we've got a situation that's actually deteriorating. We may have, you know, nobody knows where it's headed at this point, uh, but it was a good example where, you know, one person made a mistake uh, and didn't have the vision or didn't feel, feel he had the political strength, and, and they're, they're Stories throughout history of that, that, that who's in the job matters. I used to think when I went to Washington as a staff member in 1973, by the way, I was sworn in as a U.S. Senator 40 years to the day from the day I entered service as a staff member at the U.S. Senate in January of 1973. So it gives me a very interesting, I still, by the way, expect someone to come up to me on the Senate floor and say, you're not supposed to be here. You know? And I walk in and somebody says, hi, Senator, and I do this. Uh, but it, it, we, we've really got to, uh, and, and when I went down, when I went to Washington, I thought that public policy was sort of a, like Jim, a big wheel. You know, it sort of had an inevitability about it. It was going to happen because of the tides of history. No, it depends on who shows up at the committee meeting that day. We have the Americans with a... Act because Jennings Randolph was a senior senator from West Virginia and his chief aide had a disabled child and he made that happen. I really believe without Jennings Randolph there, the, 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 you know, it may have happened five, ten years later, but it wouldn't have happened when it did. It really matters who's in charge. Uh, so leadership is important. Uh, that's number five. Number six, culture is important too. And this is something Americans don't do very well. We think that everybody in the world thinks like us. You know, the European linear, this, you know, and I'll never forget, uh, uh, working for Channel 10, those of you who are as old as I am, that was before MPBN. I mean, it was, there was MPBN and Channel 10. But anyway, I did an interview with George Mitchell. I was in Maine, he was in Washington. It was the day of one of the votes on Iraq, on the, on, uh, whether to invade Kuwait, or, or I mean, whether to you know kick Saddam out of Kuwait, it was some military thing, and George was against it. And I remember interviewing him, and he said, "Well, you know, these sanctions are really working. The Iraqi economy uh, had a minus one percent growth last year, and and Saddam's going to have to respond to that." And I remember thinking, "I don't think Saddam is going to have any trouble getting his Mercedes and caviar." You know, he doesn't care about what's going on among all the people. And, and it was sort of a, George was, and I, listen, I love George. This isn't a criticism. He's the smartest man I ever met. But he was thinking that the Iraqi people thought like we did. I mean, I remember him saying, if we had a drop, a drop of GDP of 1%, people would be in the streets. And he was right. But not over there. Do, do, do you see what I mean? Because... They're different, they have different cultures and histories and expectations than we do, and we always think they're, they're you know, little uh, images of us. You know, this idea of, of democracy, if you look at history, our democracy is an anomaly, and, it's, and there was a very peculiar set of circumstances, one language, 
you know, and all of those kinds of things, and a, and a history of, you know, con fairly consistent religious backgrounds and cultural backgrounds that allowed this country to develop the way it did, but to assume we can just take that model and drop it into a place that's been, you know, in a wholly different cultural and economic and, and, and political model for a thousand years is just, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, and the, uh, uh, this was a, a very fine point was put on this for me when I met a guy, I don't know, four or five years ago, about my age, and, you know, you meet somebody, you're chatting, where are you from? He said, well, I was born in Japan. He was American. And I did the math and figured, you know, this was like 1946. And I said, that's interesting. How did you happen to be born in Japan in 1946? He said, my father was a cultural anthropologist who was an expert on the culture and history of Japan who MacArthur hired to help him write the Japanese Constitution. Brilliant. And we don't do that today. Or not as much. I mean, and, and, and you know, the Japanese Constitution is still working. If MacArthur had gone to Japan and just said, okay, here's the way it is, we the people of the scratch out United States and put in <laughs> Japan, uh, you know, I'd venture to say it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It has worked for, you know, 50, 60 years because MacArthur took the time to learn about and make sure that what he was doing was consistent with the history. And I think this is something that, I think it's one of the greatest failings of American foreign policy is to think that other people are just like us and think like us and that our solutions are necessarily going to work. Um, number seven, the real weapons of mass destruction today are unemployed 22-year-old radicalized men. That's the problem that's driving a lot of what's going on in the world. And it's gotten to the point where my staff is getting very bored with it and some members of the Intelligence and Armed Services Committee because I always have the same question. We have these briefings with the CIA, with the NSA, with the Army, the Air Force, the State Department, all these briefings about, you know, what's ISIS doing and, you know, how do we, can we get them out of Mosul and where should the airstrikes be and all this kind of stuff. And I keep saying, guys, we have to have a strategy here other than just killing them because they're coming back as fast as we're killing them. I mean, I, I, I remember the hydra. Remember the hydra from, you know, Greek mythology? Cut off one head, two grow back. That's what's happening. So, yes, we have to act militarily. Yes, we need to try to get them out of Mosul or, or whatever. But ultimately, there's got to be a, a much, much more um, uh, comprehensive strategy to deal with why are these young men falling for this? Why are they signing up? Why does somebody leave Paris to go to, go to Syria and, or Yemen and get terrorist training and go back, to, uh, go back and, and you know, kill people in, in Paris or somewhere else in the world? And, and I, I don't know the answer to that, although we did talk to the Saudis. Uh, I, I, I raised the question. I raised it everywhere. And they said, well, yes, we're now starting to think about our education system. Because that's where it's happening. In Pakistan, it's happening. Because these states are different than ours in the sense that, you know, education is a fundamental governmental service. In a lot of these countries, it's kind of over here, and it's done by the church, by the, you know, by the imams. And, and some of these places, it's a, it's a training ground for, for uh, radicals. Um, Parenthetically, I have to say, the worst mistake we can make as a country is to lump all Muslims into one bucket here. That would be awful. That's what ISIS wants. They want this to be a war between the West, particularly the United States, and, and, and Islam. We can't let that happen. Mary and I, uh, in... Uh, I was trying to think it was 2010, maybe, or uh, 12. We had a, a foreign exchange student from Ghana who lived with us for a year in Brunswick, went to Brunswick High, a charming young woman. She was a Muslim, grew up in a small town in rural Ghana. Man, you talk, she had never seen a stove before. 
She'd seen electricity, but no running water, lived in a house, town had all dirt roads. She came 5,000 miles in about 1,000 years. I mean, it was a totally different world. But she was a Muslim. She was the sweetest, most loving. She prayed five times a day. She did not know about September 11th. And when I told her about it, she said, why would anyone do that? I mean, it was just totally alien to her. We cannot make her into a radical. We've got to understand that this is not a uniform deal. This is what's going on is a small piece. Now, here's the problem. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. One-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent of 1.6 billion is 1.6 million. 1% is 16 million. That's a lot of people. So it's a serious problem, but I think one of the challenges we have in this country is to not demonize all Muslims. Because if we do, we're in for 100 years. We've got to work with the Muslims to isolate these people that are perverting Islam. And, and I, I think that's, a, that's very important. And it really bothers me when I hear, you know, in the popular media, this uh, sort of, you know, well, they're a Muslim and therefore, you know, they're a jihadist. It's not true. And uh, that, I think that's got to be a big, a big part of our, our foreign policy, but also our education policy. We need to understand this. Um, okay, number eight. Social media is really important these days. Digital media. Where's my digital teacher? Right here. Uh, it's a huge, I, ISIL lives and dies on social media. That's where they're doing their recruiting, and they're really good at it. They're better at it than we are. And that's one of the things we have to learn to do, is to be more uh, 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 counter-radical. You know, give them a different story in a medium that they're interested in and they can relate to. Uh, but but th this group has, is very sophisticated. Uh, and, and now there's a, uh, there's a publication. I'm not going to mention it because I don't want to, oh, I'm, I'm mentioning it but not by name. But there's an online radical publication where this month's issue tells you how to make a bomb that can't be detected at an airport. Step by step. It's just like, it's just like uh, Julia Child. It's a recipe with pictures. Uh, I mean, this is scary stuff. Uh, and, and, and it's the, and so this is the, you know, this is the, the bad side of, of the internet and the, the ease of communication and, and it's a lot of what's going on here. Uh, this young man in Cincinnati, you know, he got to be a radical online. Uh, so that, it's a, that, I'm not, I'm certainly not suggesting we should limit that. That's like saying, uh, I remember when we were uh, doing the beginning of the laptop project, uh, somebody said, well, there's a lot of bad stuff online. I said, yeah, and people get killed driving cars. You know, we don't buy in cars. We find ways to use them safely, and we've got to figure out ways to use this very powerful uh, tool safely. Uh, number nine. See, we're almost done. Cyber is the next war. I made a speech about this yesterday. I almost stood on my chair. I was tempted just to, because I was so wound up uh, that we're not paying enough attention to this. Sony was the wake-up call of all wake-up calls. Thank God it was a movie studio and not the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, it, it, it's, I said in the speech, it's as if Osama bin Laden sent us a text saying, I'm headed for the World Trade Center. Are you going to be there? <laughs> and we ignored it. We're ignoring it now. I mean, I'm getting to be sort of a, you know, a, a radical myself in Washington. I'm grabbing people say, when are we going to do something about this? Well, you know, it's really hard, Angus, because four different committees have jurisdiction. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm not making this up. And we're not sure about the house and everything. So I said in my speech, I said, okay, something happens. Everybody's bank account disappears. How many of you have electronic deposit of your 
paycheck. Okay. You realize you never see your money. It's all zeros and ones. What if everybody, what, I mean, imagine the chaos if everybody's money disappeared. I said, okay, we have an attack. Everybody's money disappears. Or trains all over the country derail with toxic uh, chemicals on them. Or the gas pipeline system blows up. And you go home and your, your, your constituents say, what the hell? How did this happen? And you say, well, you know, we had four committees and it was really complicated. <laughs> Come on. We've got to do something about this. Because remember I talked about state actors, non-state actors? This is something... All of those guys can play. Russia's already doing it. China is doing it, we know. Iran is doing it. North Korea, we now know, is doing it. Al Qaeda is looking into it. And then there are all these guys in their mother's basement. You know, hackers for hire. They can do it. The good news is we're the most technologically advanced and wired country in the world. The bad news is we're the most technologically advanced and wired country in the world because that means we're the most vulnerable. It's what the, the military guys call an asymmetric vulnerability. Because we're so far developed on this stuff, we're more vulnerable than most other places. And, you know, Winston Churchill described London in the 30s, he said, London is like a big fat cow tethered in the middle of a field which the Germans are going to come and bomb. Well, we're the digital big fat cow tethered in the middle of the field. And if we don't, I mean, we, you know, our companies are doing things about it, the government is doing, but all we really need to do, I mean, we can't entirely protect ourselves, but there's a lot we can do if we can get the government and the companies to work together in some way and share information and share threats and, and defend ourselves. Uh, and, and this is something we've, uh, this is a real missing piece that Congress ought to be doing something about. And somebody said, well, governor, we're spending, you know, a governor. <laughs> People see me on the street. I say, look, as long as you don't, well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, People say, you know, we're spending $550 billion a year on defense. That's enough. You remember, anybody remember the Maginot Line? The Maginot Line was built in the 30s by France after World War I to defend themselves from the Germans. And there's a sort of, it's become a cliche for a failed defense system. The Maginot Line worked. The problem was the Maginot Line went from Switzerland to the Belgian border. It stopped at the Belgian border because they said, well, the Germans won't come through the Ardennes Forest, it's too dense, and Belgium's a neutral country. Well, the day came, and the Germans came right through Belgium and overran France in six days. Not because the Maginot Line didn't work, but because it had a big gap. That's exactly the situation we're in now. We have a wonderful, strong defense program, which is necessary and important, but we have a big gap over here that's the functional equivalent of Belgium. I bet you nobody in the U.S. Senate has said that before. <laughs> uh, but that's, you, you, you see what I'm saying? We're, we're defending against all these other things, but there's this giant threat coming right at us that we're not defending against. And, and uh, I won't, you know, I've, I've, I've said enough, but, you know, shame on us if we don't, we don't deal with that. Okay, number 10. America is the world leader whether we like it or not. A lot of people say, why don't we just shut the door? You know, we, why do we need to be involved in these things? Whether we like it or not, we're the, we're the strongest country in the world. We have the strongest economy. We have the strongest market. We have the strongest uh, uh, defense uh, structure. Uh, and we're, we, ha we cannot ignore these things. There was a time maybe when we could say, well, we've got this big ocean on one side and this big ocean on the other side. We don't have to worry about this stuff. That's gone. Uh, cyber, huh. oceans have nothing to do with it. Terrorism, 
Here's my nightmare. And I mean literally, this, this keeps me awake. A nuclear weapon in, the, in one of those big metal containers in the hold of a tramp steamer headed for Boston or Miami or San Diego. You know how big a nuclear warhead is? It's about this big. It's about the big, as big as a camp footlocker. Now, the bad guys don't have those because they're very hard to make. It takes a lot of technology. You think that's going to last forever? It's a matter of time. We live in a very dangerous time, and we can't just shut the door on the rest of the world. We can't. And it's one of the reasons we have to, I believe, as much as I hate it in terms of, you know, in being engaged in these military, uh, I shouldn't say hate it, but as much as a discomfort it gives me, we can't just say we're having nothing to do with Syria. Syria is the graduate school of terrorism. It's where people are going from all over the world. There are more foreign fighters in Syria with ISIS than there are local people. They're coming from all over the world. There are 100 from the US and from Europe and all, and all over the place. And they go there for a couple of years. These guys that did the thing in Paris had been to Yemen and been trained. And then they come back. That's why we can't just say we don't care about that area because if we don't get, try to help get it calmed down, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's literally, literally a training ground for people that want to kill us. And so we can't ignore it. We can't just wish it away and say, well, you know, we're, we're just not going to pay attention to that area. It's, uh, it's too messy. It's, you know, Senator, didn't you just say it's, you know, thousand-year-old disputes? But uh, we can't ignore it. We've got to work with the people over there who are, uh, uh, they've got to bear the, the brunt of it in terms of the, the work, but we've got, to, we, we've got to help them. Now, in terms of Syria, we're bombing. And one of the guys said, and I said, what's your mission? He said, basically, we're going to reduce ISIS to a bunch of guys with AK-47s. We're going to take away their trucks and their, mobile oil programs and their infrastructure and everything else, but it's going to take people to get rid of them, ultimately. It can't be Americans. Not only because I don't want to send Americans over there, but because it won't work. The soldiers who are fighting the Muslims have to be Muslims. They ha they, otherwise, we're invaders. You know, if it's people that look like us, it's just not going to work. Inevitably, we become invaders, no matter whose side we're on when we go in. And for it to be successful, it has to be people based in the region. They have to defend, ultimately, and stand up for their own, uh, for their own countries. And I think that's starting to happen. The attack on the school in Pakistan was a big deal. That really changed attitudes in Pakistan. Recently, there was an attack on a Saudi outpost in, in southern Saudi on the, on the border of Yemen. That's gotten the Saudis' attention. They have to see this as a threat to their national interest, and I think that's starting to happen. So our role is leadership and material and training and those kinds of things. But they're going to have to take on this, this battle uh, against what is a very dangerous uh, uh, world-linked uh, uh, I don't know whether you call it an ideology or, or whatever it is, but I, I tell you, it is very, very dangerous. Well, I don't want to end on, on such a negative note, uh, and, and I, will t I, I will end by telling you that, uh, uh, and, and perhaps this is a, a little bit of a Senate story, the, uh, uh, this job is the most interesting job in the world. And what, uh, to, to have the experience of working with people like John McCain and Tim Kaine and, and uh, Chuck Schumer and all of these uh, people is really quite extraordinary. And I will tell you uh, that contrary to popular belief, we don't all hate each other. It's very interesting. The popular images of this, you know, you hear it's poisonous, 
toxic atmosphere. It is very partisan uh, institutionally, but personally it isn't. You know, it, it, they're, they're, and I told Mary, I said, I've never been in an outfit with more good, smart people that gets less done. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't quite figure that out. And hopefully we're going to be able to, uh, to break through that. But uh, it's an extraordinary experience. And um, I, I must say this, uh, 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 the foreign policy part is, uh, is fascinating and, and, and terrifying. Uh, and I just want to, I guess I'll end by thanking uh, those of you who helped me to be able to experience this and to represent you and the people of, of the United States. It's an extraordinary uh, opportunity, and I'm, I'm deeply uh, thankful and humbled by it. Thank you. That was, I'm very much against it. Again, if you want to YouTube, YouTube Angus King Energy Committee Keystone, and you'll get an earful of my position on Keystone. So I'm, I'm against it, but I'm for open debate in the United States Senate, which we haven't had a much enough of lately. So. Thank you. Will, will you continue to support, uh, uh, to vote against the Keystone Pipeline? Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you notice I reached into my pocket. In my, in, yeah. Can, yes, ma'am. Let me just finish, okay? Um, I carry in my pocket all the time. In fact, I handed one of these to one of those Republicans during the State of the Union, when the president was talking about climate change. It's a little card. I've got a whole bunch of them. Um, I actually pulled one of these out on the Bill Maher show a couple of weeks ago. It's called, I call it climate change in a nutshell. I had these made. And on this side is a million years of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what it shows is, you see these lines, it sort of jiggles around between 250 and 300 parts per million for a million years. And then it goes to 1860 when we started burning stuff. And it goes up. It goes up to, to 400 parts per million. It has, we haven't had 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere for 3 million years. And the last time we had 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, the oceans were 60 feet higher. That's history. That's just science. And then, so you look at the, to me, this chart itself answers two questions. Two of the three basic questions about climate change. One is, is something happening? Yes. You hear people say, well, in fact, Jim Inhofe was on the floor yesterday with a chart. You know how far his chart went back? A thousand years. I was going to go back on the, on the floor and say, Jim, I see your thousand. I'll raise you 999,000. <laughs> but what this says, people say, well, his, you know, it varies. Of course it varies. Yes, it varies. You can see that it varies. But not this much. This is new. The other thing this tells you is, do people have anything to do with it? Do you think it happened in 1860, 1870, when we started burning stuff in a big way? By coincidence? I don't think so. So the, the third question is, so what? What does CO2 in the atmosphere do? That's when you turn the card over. <laughs> On the back, what I have is the relationship for a million years between CO2 and temperature. And you can't see it, but it's almost an exact correlation. CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. CO2 goes down, temperature goes down. There's no, uh, I mean, it, it, it just, they just overlay one another. So to me, that, that's why I call this climate change in a nutshell. I handed one of these to Inhofe the other day. He looked at it, he looked at it and tucked it into his pocket, and I haven't heard from him since. But, <laughs> uh, but yes, and the answer to your question is yes. And why am I against it? I thought a lot about it. I mean, it's an infrastructure project. But my, my, my end point was, a, it's a backward-looking energy policy. It looks back toward fossil fuel, and we ought to be looking forward. Number two, it would facilitate the development of some of the dirtiest oil in the world. I say facilitate because one of the things I learned in my research is the reason they want to build the pipeline is it's cheaper to put oil through a pipeline than it is to put it on trains, trucks, or barges. So it literally makes the oil cheaper. 
that oil. It makes it more economic, com more economic and more economically competitive. So it will, I believe, facilitate the development of the oil. And then I learned, you know how many jobs this project will create permanent jobs? It will create a lot of construction jobs. You know any permanent jobs? 35. I was in the Energy Committee. John Hoven, the big advocate for it, was sitting right across from me. He's from North Dakota. I looked across and said, John, I can build a McDonald's in Fargo that will create more jobs in this project. Thank you for coming, Senator King. I've actually been looking forward to having some kind of a discussion for a long time. Um, I am actually very upset. I feel like your analysis of our foreign policy is very simplistic. And, um, Jeez, it I took almost an hour to cover You're the right. whole world. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing what you can do in an hour. Um, I would suggest that one of the things you could look at is that when we talk about the radicalization of Muslims is that we look at our um, policy of drone strikes, our policy of sending weapons, and actually we're not sitting in the middle of an issue. We have fomented, we have fomented the radicalization of many Muslims across the world. We've been doing that by our drone strikes. When we went into Iraq, we purposely put Shia against Sunni. When we look at Syria, we are purposely, we have many military manufacturers in this country who are profiting from war. We are fomenting terror instead of helping to really exercise leadership that helps us to become safer. When you talk about Arafat, I think he made a lot of mistakes, but the one, one peace plan that you cited as an example of poor leadership was actually to his credit. What he was being offered was the equivalent of us being given this auditorium, but not having any control over the doors of the windows where we could get in or out, or airspace. Is that a good, fair peace plan? If you look carefully, that's what you're going to find he was offered before he signed the Oslo Accords where he actually thought Israel was a good partner in peace. Instead, Israel has now over 500,000 settlements, is taking more and more land. When you go, I totally agree that you go overseas and you can learn by what you see. I went to the West Bank, by the way. Well, I, did you go to Gaza? No. No, it's why not? These are, this is directly, we are responsible for what is happening in Gaza with the five children, babies that have recently frozen to death. My son was in Israel last summer and was under rocket attack from Gaza. Oh. I agree with a lot of what she said, and I think we have to look hard at what our policies are, and that's why I talked about education and working with the Muslim countries and not demonizing all Muslims. Uh, and we didn't really talk about the Israeli-Palestinian. I did want you to know that, that I did go to Ramallah and met, met with the prime minister of, of, uh, of the Palestinian state and am trying hard to figure out what the right uh, solution is. The drones are a really hard problem. The drones have, taken, uh, have, have killed uh, much of the leadership. It it's really has crippled uh, a lot of al-Qaeda and... and you know, we historically, a drone is a highly intelligent artillery shell. And, in, and if you, have you ever seen pictures of what, sh, what Atlanta looked like after Sherman went through? The entire city was destroyed. A drone is a, is a, is a, is a very precisely targeted, and there may be collateral damage, but I know that it is immensely less collateral damage than an indiscriminate artillery shell or a bomb from an airplane because they, it's, they are targeted on individual people. The collateral damage is very small. But you're right. There are cases where it has obviously hurt, uh, radicalized people. It's a matter of what's the risk adjustment the, or, or the risk assessment of whether or not you're radicalizing people versus uh, uh, taking off the battlefield someone who is plotting to blow up the World Trade Center or uh, the Canary Wharf in London. Uh, this is a war. We don't want it. We didn't start it, but it is a war. And, and, it, and it has to be, we, we, we have to be sensitive to all the things you're talking about. I totally agree. I think I said, I, I thought the Iraq adventure was, was a terrible mistake, and it did exactly what you said. It, 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 it radicalized and created opponents that we didn't have before. I, I totally agree with that. But, 
On the other hand, we can't just say, oh, well, we're just not going to be involved with these guys uh, because they want to kill us. I'm sorry. They do. I know that. And so it's a matter of finding a policy that I think uh, deals with the very real physical threats while at the same time deals with the underlying social and political and cultural problems that you outline. I've, the president announced last week that he's having a summit meeting at the White House in the middle of February on countering extremism around the world.